Senator Cory Booker is one of 20 Democrats competing for his party's presidential nomination. He just wrapped up his two-week-long Justice for All tour, and he joins us now. Senator Booker, welcome to the News Hour. Thank you very much. It's good to be here with you. So, uh, as we said, you're one of 20. I think it's fair to say a number of voters out there are overwhelmed. They're trying to understand how is one candidate different from another. As they look at you, how do they think Cory Booker is different from any of the other candidates? Well, I think there's two things that distinguish me. One is just a very different career than the others in the race. I was a chief executive of my state's largest city through a crisis, and we actually created probably one of the best city comebacks in a decade, a city known for crime and corruption, now going through its biggest expansion economically, it's going through its biggest transformation of its school system and more. And then on top of that, um, I was, I am a United States senator that has a reputation in Washington for getting things done. In fact, the only piece of major bipartisan legislation that passed under this president was legislation I ran and I led in the Senate on the Democratic side with Dick Durbin for criminal justice reform. So getting things done in two different environments as a chief executive and as a legislature, I think points to what kind of leader I'll be. But then the last thing is really important. I think there's a lot of folks who believe that this is a time that Democrats have to fight fire with fire. As a guy who ran a fire department, that's not a really good strategy. Democrats need to define themselves not what they're against or who they're against, but we've got to define ourselves what we're for. And this is a time where our nation needs a revival of civic grace, and it needs us to call us to our higher angels, not the low road of fighting Donald Trump on his own turf and his own terms. Well, speaking of what you are for, one of the things you've talked about in your what you're calling your Justice for All tour is expanding the earned income tax credit. This is something that was originally conceived to help the working poor. You're talking about greatly expanding it so that couples earning as much as $90,000 a year would be eligible. The question is, it would cost two and a half trillion dollars over a, a, a period of years. Are you undermining the original purpose of it, which is to help the working poor? Well, I don't think so. I think families often making dual income, people making under $90,000 a year are feeling uh, the squeeze as everything, the cost of everything is going up from prescription drugs to child care. We have this nation now where baby boomers, 95% uh, of them did better than their parents. For millennials, it's now down to 50%. We have a nation that could see the first generation not to do better than the one before. And a lot of that is because we're at a time of corporate profits are at 85 year high, but wages are about a 60 year low. And instead of this bank shot of sending tax cuts like we just did, blowing trillions of dollars of holes in, in, our, in our deficits, and thinking that somehow that's gonna trickle down to working people, let's just give uh, working Americans making $50,000 a year, $40,000 a year, or couples making twice that, more of a direct uh, return on their taxes. But as we said, this would cost two and a half trillion. You've said that over a decade. You yeah. also wanna raise the minimum wage. You wanna see that raise $15 an hour. You've got other Democrats. Senator Warren wants a, a virtually free public college. He's talked about a federal daycare program. Beto O'Rourke is talking about a five trillion dollar climate change plan and on and on. A lot of this is popular, but it, voters are going to be asking, how do we pay for it? Well, I can show you how to pay for it. I can't speak to other folks, but the pay for for me are, are very obvious. Number one, you can start taxing capital gains as ordinary income. If a wealthy person buys a Picasso, sells it for a million dollars, sells it for $10 million, they're paying less of that than somebody who goes out and sweats for their job uh, as a janitor or uh, in, in a factory. They should be taxed at the same rate. That alone is going to bring in well over a trillion more dollars. Rolling back these toxic Trump tax cuts at the highest marginal income moving back the capital gains tax to where it was in the crazy wild days of the Obama era can bring in over a trillion dollars. So we can do things that we used to do in my grandparents' generation that expanded the middle class, making strategic investments, and having a tax rate that is fair in terms of not blowing holes in our deficit, but actually creating more growth for everyone. But is there a simple democratic message, though? You've got President Trump saying, look, and this is if the economy stays where it is right now, economy's continuing to grow, we've got full employment, stock market's roaring. What's the Democrats' simple uh, to understand answer? Well, you're going to have 20 different people telling you what that is. And, and my simple answer is that we are at a point in our society where the indices of success that we're using don't speak to the average American the stock market ticker or GDP numbers don't speak to people in my community. I live in a working class community that's struggling at the poverty line where people who work full-time jobs still at my corner of bodega use food stamps. Do you think they care what the stock market's doing today or what the GDP numbers? No. Donald Trump seems to have the answer to folks who have wealth, and I'm not demonizing people with wealth, but 
why are we gearing our tax code to help people with wealth get more wealth? We put $750 billion in our tax code moving wealth up. And some of those things I, I defend and, and think are okay, like the interest, mortgage interest deduction. But why aren't we starting to do things to make sure that people who work every day in America can, can have the American dream? And that's the problem that we have right now. And there seems to be a lack of empathy, a more courageous empathy is needed in our country to see the struggles of people from factory towns to farm towns to, to, to city towns who can't even afford the rent in their cities anymore because costs are going so high. You do favor the Medicare for All plan and introduced by uh, Senator Sanders. In essence, it's single payer. It would, within four years, do away with virtually all private health insurance. Your state of New Jersey, just in November, elected new members of Congress, Democrats, heavily Republican districts. Do you think voters in those districts want to see their private health insurance go away? Well, I'm a pragmatist. I ran a city and had to try to bend the cost curve of health care. The way we're doing it around doesn't work. Now, I say Medicare for all, but I'm also a person that's going to tell you in the next breath, we can't get there right away. We need to start showing first and foremost that we can create a viable public option just by reducing Medicare eligibility to 55. We were one vote away from doing that right before I came into the Senate. That alone would drive down costs. It would actually create lower costs for people that are in the private market because more older people would come into that public option. So there are really pragmatic steps we can take to accomplish our goals, expanding health care, lowering costs. A few other things I want to ask you about in your Justice for All plan. You favor, you've long worked on justice, uh, uh, criminal justice issues. You want to give convicted felons the right to vote. As I'm sure you know, Senator Sanders has said, they should not only have the right to vote when they're released from prison, they should have that right while they're incarcerated. Do you agree with him? I, I just think that that is a frustrating uh, debate that we seem to now be having. As a guy who lives in an inner city black community and knows that there are millions of Americans that are being arrested and convicted and should never be there in the first, and not only lose their right to vote, but they lose their liberty, let's get this conversation back to where it is right now. Our prison population in this country has gone up 500% since 1980 alone. We locked up more people for marijuana in 2017 than all the violent crimes combined. And so here we have a nation that takes away people's liberty and their right to vote for doing things that two of the last three presidents admitted to doing. So if Bernie Sanders wants to get into it, Bob, in the conversation about whether Dylan Roof and the Marathon Bomber should have the right to vote, my focus is liberating black and brown people and low-income people from prison because we have a system in America, as Brian Stevenson says, it treats you better if you're rich and guilty than if you're poor and innocent. My focus is tearing down the system of mass incarceration so that we don't even have to have the debate about people's voting rights because they're not going to prison in the first place. People that don't belong there are there, and I'm going to stop that as president. Senator Cory Booker will be following you on the campaign trail. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Thank, Thank you. you.